G'day, g'day, wherever you are in this wonderful universe. This is Mastering Music, Mastering Life. Tony Jack, the Bear Man's in the house here at Deluxe Mastering, Melbourne, Australia. And uh, today I'm so happy to have uh, a guy who I've been chasing down for a very long time and just through circumstances and situations, we haven't quite been able to make it work. But finally, we've got him here. So from Wonderlick Management and Label, Mr. Greg Donovan. G'day, mate. Hey, Jack. How you doing, champ? Good, buddy. It's so good to finally be able to have this uh, chat with you because in the uh, the old uh, podcast format, which I really did enjoy doing, I must say, we had three cameras here and we had a, you know, we had it all edited on the fly. It was, it was, it was really slick. But, of course, I did it on the Sunday night, which, of course, always uh, limited to people either being from Melbourne or being in Melbourne at the time. And, of course, I know you're always keen to get on, on board and we never could make it work. But now by doing it this way and uh, by being able to have you, where you are in your offices in Sydney or anyone else around the world, it, it sort of opens up more possibilities. So anyway, mate, it's just great to have you on. Thank you for joining me. Happy to be here. So, uh, so Greg, for those of you who don't know you, uh, you're, 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 an art, you're, you're an artist manager, you're on a label, you've been in the industry for many, many years. And um, management is one of those areas I've always been fascinated by because uh, it seems like management is what makes or breaks an artist. And we often hear about stories about, a lot of artists who go broke because of bad management and whatnot. Uh, but I was watching a documentary on Sh- um, Chef Gordon Supermensch, and I was um, I was so I love him, love that documentary too. He's such a great manager, that guy. Yeah, isn't he? And um, and and I just one of the things I really loved that he said is that he never. Um, I think he he never did. He always did handshake deals, which I thought was really quite extraordinary in this world, where you know everyone's down to contracts and 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 whatnot. Uh, that's I, I find that extraordinary. I don't know how we was able to do it, man. But shit, uh, if you if you tried to do handshake deals, how far do you reckon you'd get? Seriously, in in, in the current world that we yeah. live in, it's pretty crazy. I mean, yeah, I'll give you an example. I mean, I've you know been managing Grinspoon since their second album now, so I think I'm in year eighteen of of their. 20 year career or, or something close to that anyway. Um, we signed a management agreement that went for four years back then. We've never re signed it again. I've been on a handshake agreement with them ever since that just that contract is in play. It's a very simple contract. It's fair on them, fair on me. Um, and we just work on that way. I mean, I kind of, you know, when I have label deals, I've got joint venture with Sony, they've got business affairs departments. There's no way around all of that. But where possible, we need to have paperwork simply to show people, oh, this is what happens when it all goes wrong. Contracts should be a prenup. You should have one, but it doesn't mean you need to keep extending it every time. I mean, Bob Dylan's manager said it the best. If the birdie ain't happy, the birdie won't sing. So what's the fucking point in your contract? I, personally, I think it just shows what happens to the money when it comes in. Who gets what? How's it pre-agreed? What happens when we break up? Where, what happens to the money, what happens to the rights, what happens to things at that point. They are the important things here. They should be looked at like prenups and how to break up the money so there's no confusion there. Other than that, they're not worth a lot. Yeah, yeah. So, mate, mate so how did you get into the industry? I mean, you started up in Canberra back in the day. So, what, just, just briefly tell people, what was your journey to get uh, to where you currently are right now? All right, well, the, the quick version is like a lot of people in this business, so I'm a failed musician. You know, I played drum bands. I loved organising band practice. I was managing my band before I knew I was a manager just because no one else was doing it. So I was organising band practice. I got our first gigs, you know, when I was 15 years old at youth centres in Canberra. And I quickly realised if I put on two or three gigs at these youth centres on weekends, I could do something I loved and still make as much money as my mates did working at McDonald's while we were in high school. Uh, and so I kept at it. And from there it grew. I became a local promoter in Canberra. I met guys, promoters um, like, you know, Chuggy and Steve Pav by just putting up their posters and being their kid running around doing everything for them. And that got me a job in Sydney, worked for Pav. And I wanted to become, I always wanted to be a manager after I decided not to be a drummer. So I was trying to work the locks on that, managing Canberra bands, not making any money, obviously, like everyone at the start. So I thought I need to do something in the business. I need more contacts, I need more knowledge. There was nowhere to study back then in the very early 90s, late 80s for this. So um, I went about trying to work experience there when I rang everyone and tried to work for free. And, you know, guys like Michael Harrison gave me a break up in Sydney and I went and did a little work experience at Harbour. And, and then Steve Pav gave me some work experience and then he gave me a job. And then I got tour management work after being there a while. And Nick Tischler, who's still at Live Nation, trained me as a tour manager. And I got lucky there and, and sort of 
tap this alternative vein in the early 90s and got to work with everyone from the Beastie Boys to Fugazi to Ben Harper to, you know, Pearl Jam and all this sort of stuff. So that really launched my career from being the kid who stuck up posters and put on local shows in Canberra to being this sort of promoter representative in, in Australia. And then that got me connected with American bands that I started touring around America with and around the world. And I did a short period of time, not a huge amount of time traveling around the world as a tour manager and then knew this isn't for me. I love it, but I'm, I could fill myself with my, you know, few grand a week and all this. That was great. You know, it was really exciting after being poor for so long. And, but I knew it was a bit of a ceiling trap. I, I could see the tour managers and the roadies around me and I was like, I'm not one of them. How come I'm not fitting? I got on great with them and I would jump in front of trains for them and fix things for them. But I always knew I wasn't one of them. They're kind of a breed to themselves. And that made me really refocus on going back to Australia and becoming a a manager and, and setting up my management company and luckily when I came home the first band I started tour managing to make money was Grinspoon and their manager just decided to leave the business for personal reasons and I came in as a caretaker manager and then I stepped up and, and really worked hard to become permanent manager and I'm still in that seat today. You were saying before that there was no education back in the day as, as it was in mine when I first started out. Do you think that the formal education method of going doing a music course of some degree as opposed to getting your hands dirty on the job. I mean, for example, if you're looking for someone now, do you think you could train someone or work with someone from the ground up by uh, just get, throwing them in the deep end and getting, you know, getting, letting them get their hands dirty? Or do you think that yeah, having some... I, I think there's an argument for both. But if I was given a choice for a younger person, I'd say jump in and get your hands dirty because it changes every five seconds. It's a living, breathing thing. It took me a little while to realise that I had to get really good at failure and I had to get good at admitting that that was then and this is now. So I might be in front of someone one year going, no, this is really bad, this can't happen, this is terrible for musicians. And then a year later I go, actually, you know what, this isn't the worst thing in the world. You know, I guess, you know, download, free downloads and people are downloading illegally was sort of the first thing where that happened, where I was so angry at first, I felt like, you know, our fans were stealing from us. I felt let down by the whole world, by, you know, aren't you music fans? What are you doing? How are we going to pay our bills? How are these musicians going to make the next record? I felt heartbroken and I felt like the world had left music alone and the last people, our fans, our supporters, were kicking us while we were down. It was a horrible time. But it didn't take long before I realised, you know what, it's not their fault. It was the music industry's fault. We screwed it up. The Australian record industry should have bought Napster. They shouldn't have sued it. They should have worked out how to monetize the chaos down the line. We've worked out how to monetize chaos now. Streaming's done that. Spotify's done it. But that was up to us. The industry for years gave them one or two good songs and a whole bunch of filler on records. And, you know, we pulled singles off the shelf after 3,000 sales to force them to buy records they didn't even want. We did all of these things to our fans. And then La Zurich comes out and says stupid shit. And the American record industry sues fans and grandmothers for downloading music illegally. And they made it cool to download illegally. And then we went on to these years of being destroyed by it and a lot of the industry kept complaining about it i kept saying it's not their fault don't blame them it's up to us to fix the chaos and do it that's one example of like being able to shift your ego out of what you believe because it is an ever-changing thing and the music industry is one of those industries that sets the pace for other industries. I mean, if you look at technology, it's often porn first, music industry second, yeah. TV yeah. movies follow us, yeah. and then the rest of the world start catching on. That's generally what happens. But porn showed the way for streaming, you yeah. know? That showed the way for, uh, you know, a little bit for free, the, the subscription-based models, and the music industry went, oh, that works, let's go there. They've always done that with tech. So I think it's interesting that you need to be able to pivot, change. You need to have a very malleable brain to do this. So getting an education might be one person's version they're teaching you of that moment in time for them. There are benefits to that. There are certainly good teachers out there with some great experience in the industry. So I'm not saying it's not good to do. Most of the people who work for me have been to do music courses at Macquarie Uni or or, you know, other industry education places. And to me, if I have five applicants and I like, really like two of them and one of them's done that course and the other one hasn't, then one of them shows like they've got a lot more commitment to me. So just the, the fact that they did it had a lot of value to me. Now, if it was two people who had never been in the industry before, that would be a little, a uh, bit more of a difficult decision to make. Yeah. I, um, like you, I've had a bit of a flip on schooling. I once... Um 
used to think of formal education as not com a complete waste of time, but I felt that uh, there were probably better ways to spend the money if you were spending a lot of money. But having said that, um, sometimes you just have to be in a position where you're prepared to say, I was wrong. And now I see, um, you know, teaching in the way and teaching as a different thing, because quite ironically, as a master engineer myself, I'm now becoming a bit of a teacher as well. <laughs> so, um, I think there is, um, there, there is value in, in that sort of thing. Having said that though, I think there's some qualities, for example, you know, some of the skills you need, uh, particularly as a manager, I don't know if you can really, you know, teach. And I think one of those things is, you know, people skills and, and being able to trust in your gut. And uh, being I always tell people I wish I got a psychology degree. It's the only <laughs> degree I wish I had. You know, and uh, and you know, being able to negotiate because I think one of the hardest things all of us do, uh, particularly a lot of artists, will say, "Well, how much should I charge?" And uh, how much? How much am I worth? And they're not sure. And you know, so you as a manager, got to, you know, uh, got to have that skill to be able to sort of sit there and be able to determine, you know, what a, what the fees are, what the rates are, and all that sort of thing. So, how do you go, how do you, how do you go about doing that for yourself, though? You're able to do it well for others, but how do you how do you negotiate for yourself? Um, you you know I think in the early days of being a manager, I probably let myself down a lot because I would hyper focus on my artists and wanting the right thing by them, and and then I'd you know pull off these great feats working closely with them. We would pull off these great feats together, and and then I'd kind of come home and go, oh wow, well, I haven't even done the laundry or the dishes for a week, and I can't seem to get my shit together financially and I haven't, you know, I just keep spending money. I'm not really looking at my future. And, and I just sort of realized I'm not managing myself. So at some point I did say to myself, I have to treat myself more part of my life. Like I'm a client for myself. Mm -hmm. And I had to, you know, I could see myself giving advice to artists about, you know, Oh, you're, you know, this is years ago, but we talk about maybe substance abuse or maybe they didn't realise that binge drinking is a form of alcoholism and you don't, you know, just because you take two or three days, days off every week doesn't mean you're not alcoholic. You might have a real problem if you binge drink every single Thursday, Friday, Saturday. That could be a real problem that's actually a learned behaviour get really bad. And I'd talk to them and they'd sit there going, oh, wow, you know a lot about this. This is great. And then they'd go off to try to fix their lives. And then I'd go home and have shitload of drinks and smoke a whole bunch of weed and sit there going, what am I doing? You know, like yeah. I've been drinking on the weekends to deal with my stress. So I realized that I had to, if I couldn't look after myself, I wasn't going to be able to look after my artists. So it actually became a business decision to look after myself better. Yeah. And um, in the current, in the current, now as we were saying earlier on that, there's more talk about mental health and substance abuse in the music industry. And we got really guys like, you know, Tom Larkin who are out there who I consider a bit of a poster boy, but as you said yourself, you've been out there talking about it too, but uh, you said that no one ever asked you about it. So, and you haven't spoken that much publicly, I guess, because no one's ever asked you. So, so tell me, how do you broach the subject with, um, with artists? Is it something um, when you take on someone new, is that something that you look into or you investigate or is it sometimes uh, something that creeps up later on in the relationship and you feel you need to nip in the bud? How do you, how do you, how do you go about managing it, all that stuff? It generally creeps up on you later. I mean, we don't, we definitely don't look at it at first. I mean, you can generally tell in those first meetings if there's something, you know, not quite right. I think we all have our own version of our radar for, for other humans and how we work those things out. But this is, the music business if you eradicated all the interesting not great functioning people you're eradicating a lot of the great things that come with this business i think accepting the fact that we're all just a big bunch of tropical fish in a tank with loads of different colors and sizes and variations and we all have our pros and our cons is an important way to look at it um otherwise you just it's pop music, <laughs> you know, if you're making it all clean and safe and simple and happy and, you know, all like that. But, you know, we don't do pop music. It's not, we, we do alternative music. We like to think of ourselves as, a, as annoying as this sounds to our musicians, a mainstream alternative label and management company. Mm -hmm. And um, so we, we like long-term careers is the bottom line. So for us, I don't really care if you're a little bit crazy. That's okay. That sort of comes with it. But the way we deal with it as we go along is trying to, if there is a problem that raises its head, and if we are asked to be involved or if we try to talk to them on the side without other people around and 
say, hey, we, we're aware something's going on. It seems like it. Do you want to talk about it? If they decide they want to open up to us, because we're their business managers, remember, our job is to build their career, not look after their personal lives. So you have to pull yourself out of that at some point and go, they do need help. Let's see if they want to put their hand up. And if they do, you need to work out if their family and friends are capable of helping. Where are they at with this? Can we bring them in to take over? Have you talked to them yet? A lot of people are scared to talk to their families about these things too. Some people just don't have functioning families that can help and we might be able to help with specialists, with support groups, just try to be a bit of a mechanical nuts and bolts to push them in the right direction for their discovery of how to help themselves with mental health or substance abuse issues. Um, so it's really about trying to involve family and friends and trying to manage your way out of that situation. Not because you don't want to deal with it, because it's not our jobs and they do need help. So you've got to become a friend at that point and try to find the right people to help them. Um, and I guess that's really, you know, where, where a lot of that comes from. Um, we've been fairly lucky in the sense that the issues that we've gone through with our roster over the years, we've been lucky in the sense that all of them bar one have had fantastic family uh, setups. So once it became an open conversation, the families were just brilliant and got involved and fixed things and came to us for little things every now and then when they needed stuff from a professional point of view. Um, so we've been fairly lucky in that thing. We have had one instance where the family's been just useless, um, actually toxic, and that was incredibly difficult to deal with. And so we, we were more involved in that and I got involved with trying to get specialists involved and proper therapists working on it. I mean, I'm, I'm just a manager, a band's guy runs a label, really need to find people who can professionally help them and, and send them in the right direction. Yeah, I, uh, I, I hear what you're saying. I'm, I'm still, it's interesting, I find that even though we are having a, a bigger and broader discussion and more people are becoming more and more open, uh, still there seems to be a stigma attached to it and still there is a lot of fear around people opening up and sharing this stuff. And I think particularly blokes, because as men, we're, we're meant to be these hard, tough people who can stand up to shit and, we're not meant to show too, too much emotion and, and um, you know, being, uh, being vulnerable is sometimes uh, perceived as being a, a, a weakness. And um, I still find that at times uh, with people. I mean, I get clients here all the time and uh, for some reason I don't invite it, but it, it's just people spilling their guts. And it's extraordinary. Some people that you would never think, you know, they've got shit going on, but uh, they've got some real heavy things. But their um, the reluctance to open up to uh, other people uh, is there because again, uh, particular social media and that, um, and not invite, say, hey, listen, man, you know what? You've got an opportunity here to actually be a spokesperson of sorts. You've got a profile. Um, you know, people would look at you, I would think, and uh, think that you're really being very brave, but uh, they still I feel like, no, you know what? I'm going to soldier on, soldier on, soldier on. Um, so I, I find that quite sad, but you can't make, uh, can't make people do these things. But I think if more people would no. open up, but, you know, I, th I think this is true and I really like the fact that the industry is really talking about it a lot. I love what Support Act are doing to support mental health within the industry, all the tools they're giving us to put into itineraries for crew and bands on the road. All these sort of things are fantastic. Um, and what you're saying really hits home to me. I'm a 47-year-old male. I've been, you know... Um, I'm exactly what you just mentioned before. I, I don't like talking about my personal problems. I don't do it. I think the main reason is I'm scared shitless of the perception that new clients might have. I'm, I'm happy with the relationship I have with existing clients. I'm worried that someone's going to read something about me somewhere and go, oh, well, it's between, you know, um, Greg Donovan and Kat Faraday and she's, I've read that, you know, this, this, I like them both, but she's doesn't have the issues Greg has, therefore I'm going that way. So I really worry about talking about it. As a consequence, I've actually never spoken public about the fact that, you know, I have ADHD and a little bit of Asperger's and I've I diagnosed, I'm treated for it. I handle it as well as I can these days. I do a lot of hiding my symptoms and my issues. Um, a lot of people think ADHD is a bit of a joke. They don't understand it, even in the medical medical community it's yeah. a poorly understood thing until i got with specialists i didn't realize why i was having all these private little mental breakdowns in the background all the time and hiding them from everybody and why i was doing a whole bunch of weird shit i couldn't understand why everyone was telling me my whole life to sit down stop being so passionate be quiet why are you talking over everything you know you can, you can kind of tell i've got adhd probably talking to me now and i'm okay with that now. and i'm okay with talking about it to people who ask me i don't go out and tell them anymore 
Um, and this is literally the first time I've ever mentioned it publicly. I think a lot of my roster and people and even some of my best friends would go, oh, I thought so, I thought there was something there. Mm. But it is one of those silent things. It's not a mental health issue. It's a, it's a, brun a brain function disorder. That's what it is. My brain just simply works differently to other people's brains. Yeah. And I think the best way to describe it is that if your brain was a professional assistant, your brain, most neurotypical people's brains could sit there and go, yep, yep, come in. They need to see you now. Put the tools here so they can get the job done. Uh, no, you can't come in now. They need a little bit of time. Those, most people's brains do that for them. They get tired and they make mistakes. But generally speaking, the job gets done. My assistant, my professional assistant is going, everybody in the room, everyone in the room. They yell out the window, anyone else want to come in? Come on, anything, anyone, come on in. And sometimes it stands in front of the door and goes, no, nope, you're not coming in. I don't care, you're his mum. No, nope, yeah. yeah. no. Nope. <laughs> so that's what an ADHD brain does. It either hyper-focuses or it shuts down completely. But the bottom line is it's like this eight tentacled octopus hat on your head at all times. And it just randomly grabs onto everything. And every now and then all eight ten tentacles go, boof and latch onto one thing. And that for me luckily has been my business and I hyper-focus on my business and I use it almost like therapy. And this is great for my clients, it's great for me. Um, I will stay up all night for the people I'm passionate about and interested in to get shit done for them. Um, I will do some pretty crazy shit to make stuff happen for them and get things across the line. And that comes from having ADHD. I've learned to use it as a benefit for me, but it's taken medication, therapists, um, I still have, you know, cognitive behavioural therapy every month. It's it's a constant thing that I have to look after for myself. I have to look after the fact that ADHD people have substance abuse issues as well. Um, and I've had that with alcohol and marijuana. So, you know, you you need to look after yourself. You need to get help. And I just thought, oh, I don't need the help. I'm functioning. I've managed these bands that are doing well. I'm doing all this. And I just kept having breakdowns in the background. And it, I didn't talk to anybody. It's the biggest mistake I've made in my adult life. And it wasn't until I had that total breakdown. And, and all of this I did hidden from the industry, from my clients, from my best friends, you know, pretty much just my partner Mel knew about it at the time and she didn't even know everything. It was just really hard for me to talk about. And I was so scared that everything I had and worked for was going to go away because I had it. And you know what, when I started talking to everyone about it and being open, I joke about it now openly. Um, nobody gives a shit. Everybody's understanding. Mm. Nobody did that to me. It was all paranoia in my brain. Yeah. It was catastrophizing. It was the, and the it was, people are brilliant about it. I think yeah, you're right in the perception. And my experience has been look over the last uh, let's just say three or four years. I've been, as you know, I've, I've been. You know, I'm a master. I'm a master engineer. I have my studio. I have my clientele. Um, but one of the things I'm very passionate about now is sharing my journey as um you know I, I call myself a late bloom in so many respects of life because a lot of what i the way i think now the way i operate i'm a very different person to what i was maybe five six definitely 10 years ago a very very different um uh, version of me and a lot of that required me to be open and be honest and like yourself mate i was really shit scared about sharing these things because in the you know for many many years mate i was you know doing lots of lines i would say that vast majority of my career i was off my head when I was uh, when I was mastering, a lot of people just wouldn't have known because I got good at being able to keep a relatively, yeah. you know. Uh, but in the background, it was tears and breakdowns and and you can get it that stuff, you know, uh, all that kind of thing. And 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 now it's like um, it's not that I don't care. It's not well, I don't really care as much about what people think because I think there's enough people out there who are really doing it hard, my man. And uh, I think, as I said, and, and I don't consider myself any great fucking shakes or some hugely profile person. I have a profile of sorts, um, but I feel, you know what, if I can gear that in the way that may help some kids along the way, because getting in early is the key, man. It's like, it's never too late to change. never too late to get your life together. But if we can get in early, because it's, these are the kids are like the pebbles in the lake of life that when they're dropping and they're going to create the most reverberation of waves, you know? as I move forward. Yeah. So, so, you know, prevention, intervention, getting in early uh, is where we can do, um, you know, uh, the, the, the most good. And, and again, mate, thank you so much for sharing that and, uh, and appreciate that. And hopefully someone sees this or watches you and they go, fuck, cause you know, you're, you're, you know, without pissing your pocket, you're a fucking, you're a moving to shaker, man. So, you know, people hearing with this sort of stuff, I'm ho hopefully it's going to help people along. And it's, that's fucking great. So thanks, man. Thanks, man. Oh, it feels nice to say that out loud, to be honest. So, <laughs> yeah. So, so listen, mate, just on a little tangent, 
like me, um, you have a, an aversion to having ink done. <laughs> when, did you, when, did you first, <laughs> when did you first get yours done? Uh, what's sort of style? Because well, I, I haven't actually had a proper look at your tattoos. So, um, what's... I really like the Japanese stuff just because I like the way it flowed. I like all the stories behind it all. Uh, first tattoo I ever got was, I don't know if you can see that, was Cat in the Hat on his own. Oh, I love and it. Then I, I built the, the world around him. The whole idea of the Japanese stuff is that, you know, they're telling family stories and family history. So I kind of pulled it into my world because on the other side, I've got Yoda on there. I don't know if you can see him. Yeah, Master Yoda, yeah. <laughs> and so uh, this is me trying to tell my story. I remember going, I'm not a huge Star Wars nerd. I just, I got two older brothers and I remember in 77 going to see Star Wars and having my mind blown. You know, I was seven years old at the time and I remember just sitting there like, what am I watching? You know, it was a really special moment for me looking back creatively and like, what can we do? You know, it was, it really did something to my brain. And so for me, the tattoos are kind of just sort of, remind me of the great childhood I had. I had a great family. I was very lucky, still do, you know, had great older brothers, very supportive and helpful. And a lot of this just reminds me of all of that. Um, I'm kind of a little odd in ways. I've got little quotes tattooed on me in places. I think that's to do with my ADHD, things like my experience is what I agreed to attend to. <laughs> very <laughs> pragmatic statement that probably seems incredibly obvious to anybody that doesn't have ADHD, but it, 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 I use it like a fidget gadget. It, it brings me back in a focus and I can literally, if I feel my brain wandering off and I can't control it, I can look at that and just for a second, for some reason, it snaps me back in. And so I've got little tattoos I even use as tools at times, but generally, I just like all the big colour of it all and I yeah. kind of feel like people go, won't you regret that one day? I'm like, won't you regret that you did nothing with that bear skin? Yeah. <laughs> That's what well, I'm about. well, you know what? I got my first tattoo at 40, it was, it was 2009. So I was 46 or 47 and um, no particular reason other than I just never found an artist I really liked. And um, uh, a guy who came to see us one day, uh, a client came in and he had this script around his neck and I really liked the font. I said, fuck, who did that? He said, well, oh, our drummer, he's a tattoo. I said, are you serious? I want to get a tattoo. So I got my tattoo that very night uh, from that drummer. Well, and, and it never, um, and, and it was just, my first one was just getting Jack the Bear on my forearm <laughs> in, that, in, that, in that same font. And so, uh, and I thought, you know, I need, I need one more else to balance it out. So my next one was um, just coincidentally, well, my, my old time favorite saying is no guts, no glory, which coincidentally was a, a, an airborne, a title of an airborne album. Yeah. So, uh, so that was just a complete coincidence. That wasn't me being a, a fanboy. And then, <laughs> and then it just kind of went from there. So, I'm probably about 65% covered. And if you said to me, you're going to get crazy with it, I would have laughed at you, but, but I still, I still, they are, but I, I, I st the, the other great thing I think about tattoos is that it's the one thing you can do for yourself. It'll stay with you forever. Um, it's always there. And like yourself, man, I've got little sayings and little odd sods and a little bit of a story and bits of family and, and whatnot. And yeah, I look, I'm, I, I dig them. I'm really into them. I'll, uh, I, I think yeah, they're yeah. a one, I, I think they're a, um, a wonderful, wonderful thing. So Amy Shark's doing really well for you, my friend. Um, now, I know nobody has a crystal ball, but when you first came across her, did, was it something that, uh, did, did you get this little little funny feeling in your trouser leg that went, um, I thought we were onto something here? Or was it just, or yeah. was she, or was she just someone that you just, she, you just really liked? And, you know, is it, is it always just subjective with you? Or do you think there is something that you can tell whether, in, whether it's instinct or whether it's because you can kind of read the market that tells you, I think we got to check. Anybody who does this a lot gets a little instinctive vibe for things. I think that was the Malcolm Gladwell book, Blink, where he talks about the 10,000 hour theory. You know, you do something for 10,000 hours, and then you just know when you're looking at it. Yep. I, I think that's, for most people, that's what happens. And I think that happens to us in the business now. And the way it works at Wonderlick is I've got a business partner, uh, Stuart McQueen and I own Wonderlick 5050, all of it, all the companies. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a way of sharing your music with each other where we don't poison the well. So he'll literally just send me a link and just say, new artist. Well, I won't even say a name. When I click the link, I'll see a name, whatever. So I click this link and it's Amy Shark Adore, right? And Stu, Stu had found it and sent it to me. And um, just sent me this link and didn't say a thing. And I listened to Adore and I just got that little, you know, the goosebumps and the hairs and that little like, what am I listening to? And I had to play it again and went, 
okay, that sounds like a hit to me. And I emailed Stu back and go, sounds like a hit. And he just came back with like five paragraphs. He was like, no shit, man, I'm more excited about this than anything. And so he was dying to go, dude, let's do this. But he didn't, he didn't want to poison the well. And, and not, I don't normally say it sounds like a hit. I'm nine out of 10 times just saying, there's a huge amount of potential here. This sounds really cool. I'd love to get in the trenches with this band with you and let's let's start developing. That's That's nine out of 10 times. Amy kind of, you know, came out of there with this. And, and then I said, Stu, have you heard any more? And he's like, yeah, I rang, a, I rang her the second I heard this song and asked for more music, check this out. And, you know, and so he was the first person I know of anyway in the industry to be talking to Amy in terms of, we want to make you an offer. We're, we're here, we're ready to go. Some people had kicked, you know, kicked the tyres earlier before a door. Um, many people came after us the, the weeks following us, but... Um, Stu was in there first and I think that really changed how Amy viewed Wonderlick as a label um, because we're in there when there was no noise, there was no chatter, we're in there early. But yeah, we did notice that, I mean, you know, I've been in the business a while, you hear a door and you don't think that that's going to be a hit, you're not, you just shouldn't be doing it. It wasn't great talent from our point of view to notice that, you know, I got 12 year old godson that I played it to and oh, it sounds like a hit for you, Greg, you know, like it wasn't that hard to work out. Amy is a very talented writer and we got her at a period where she had developed herself quite far. So she wasn't like one of these new bands trying to find their feet, a little bit of an, you know, oh, clearly this is where the band's probably going to go, but right now they're still working themselves out. She was a fully formed artist. She knew exactly what she wanted, what she wanted to sound like and where she wanted to go. So she was rather unique in that sense. So in, in that respect, given that she's um, got her shit together, so to speak, um, you guys just basically then, um, in terms of the creative stuff, do you still find you have any kind of input there or is it just still strictly yeah. the business and you well, just let her you, say, I want to work with this producer for argument's sake, you know, and off you go. Yeah. Well, Stu's her A&R guy and Stu and her work directly together, constantly on all the music, you know. Amy is absolutely leading the charge and Stu sees it as his job to deliver the vision Amy has for herself. So he will go out, they'll talk producers, they'll talk options, why is it the best one for what Amy wants for herself? And then he'll go and get them and make it happen. But um, because Amy's on our label and we don't manage her, she's managed by Unify. Um, I do more of the management type stuff and touring and marketing and release type stuff on the side of the company where the creative A&R within the label is very much Stuart's thing. Uh, Stu, within the company, definitely takes credit for discovering Amy. Though I say artists discover themselves and we just come along and ride their coattails. But Stu is very much the guy who deserves all the credit for that. Um, and I say that internally all the time. And as soon as I'm out of this environment, I take all the credit I can get. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you, you, you guys find that you're still looking, looking out or uh, still look at things that come in? Or is the case of right now, you know, that you're juggling enough balls and you can only dedicate so much time to what you got um, to be able to give everyone you know, as, as much love as, as you will, you know, uh, towards their careers? Or do you find that you still need to keep your eye and ear open to something else just in case something else comes along that could be quite special? Always, always looking for the next thing. Always got the ears and eyes open for it. Um, even if we feel like we're kind of booked up time-wise, we'll find a way to grow and fit it in um, and make it work. But that being said, we have grown in slow, painful increments on purpose because it's all been about time management. Every time we find an act we like we will, and we know we want to make an offer before we make that offer, we sit down and make sure what we're offering them we can deliver. We make sure we have the time, skill set, staff and tools to deliver what they want for themselves. So it's um, really important to us that, that that is in play before we sign them. I mean, we just signed clues to the label. I don't know if you know them, two sisters. Um, they've got a song uh, called Museum that they did on their own that's on Triple J right now. Um, and we signed them to the label. Our new a &R guy, Dan Cranick, signed them. Uh, that's very recent. We're just about to go out with the first... Even though Museum's um, out, the next song that we're about to release is the first one on the label and the beginning of their, what we hope will be a real strong career for them. And they're an amazing talent. And we, the song just got finished the other day. It's unbelievably good. And what they're working on and the writing they're doing is great. So we're, we're always on lookout what's new. We've got Japanese wallpaper coming out. Um, he's not necessarily brand new, but he's, you know, he's definitely an up and comer. Um, I mean, that, 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 kid, that kid's a freak. He was um, doing a lot of recording with uh, Andre Ehrman, who used to work out of here. Up until um, up until last year, and 
you know, when I met him, he was like 15 or 16, you know, Jewish kid at private school doing crazy shit and getting so much uh, attention. He's, he's, he, he's amazing. And I think he's going to do big things. I really do. So I'm, I'm really glad yeah, that you guys got him on. We tried to sign him back then when he, you remember when everyone first started hearing about him on Unearth Tie, right? I think he was 15 or 16 around then. And, and Stu, again, Stu bought it to me and I was like, oh, fuck, this is so cool. And we tried signing him and we got shut out. Oh, I wants to finish school, days, which was a good idea for him at the time. And we just stayed there and stayed there. And so, you know, like that was years ago and we signed him a few months ago. So that was an act that we were on for years. Literally every time there was the right moment, we'd go back into the, hey, Gabs, how you doing? Yeah, Where's yeah. this at now? What's, you know, he's interested, still don't want a record deal. We've still got one on the table for you. So eventually um, he decided that was the right thing for him. And um, yeah, we're, the, the first single's out right now on Triple J through us and doing really great. Just came out last week. Oh, that's fabulous. So you guys are expanding? Oh, I saw you have expanded or you got an office overseas? Yeah, we've got an office in New York now. Global, um, global enterprise. Here we go. Yeah, yeah, we're really happy about that. So, because most of our bands are touring internationally a lot, you know, Boy and Bear, Airborne, Paper Kites, um, Montaigne's about to start doing a lot of international touring. Um, you know, so it's important to us to be over there in boots on ground. And also with Amy working overseas, she's signed to our label worldwide. So it's through RCA, through our joint venture, through one of the Sony camps. Um, and so it's important to us to make sure that even though we're not working the release in North America, we, you know, it's really management, it's unified and the RCA guys that are really, you know, driving that internationally, but it's still an interest to us. So we are over there making sure that things are happening right. And if there's any extra support and help we can give, then we're there to do that. Uh, and also it's just a good time to be around because you know what Americans are like when things are positive, it's good to be around them. They love you a lot when things are going well yeah. and you can, build your relationships better when you're being successful. When things are treading water or not so successful, it's harder to get in the door with them. So we're trying to make hay while sun shines, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, and it's going really well. I'm spending all of November in America. Stu's over there regularly. Um, you know, I'll be going between LA and New York for the whole month and come back in time for the Arias, uh, which is exciting. Amy's got the most nominations with nine nominations this year. So that's amazing. exciting. It's amazing. Yeah, it really so, yeah, we're building out in that front. You know, we're hoping one day to open the London office, but it's got to make sense. The timing's got to be right. I don't think that's that far off, to be honest. Um, and, yeah, we are growing as we go. I mean, the one thing we haven't tried to grow too much is our management company because that is such a nuts and bolts day-to-day -day thing. It's so important to the artists that we are there for them at all times. So we keep that fairly tight. Um, we are open to adding things to the management company. I mean, Stu and I were just saying a couple of weeks ago that it's the first time in a while we feel like we actually have room for something in the management company that will require a lot of attention. Um, and so we're kind of open to that at the moment and, and keeping our ear to the ground. But, you know, we're, we're in a lucky position these days. The management company's working great. Our, our label's on fire. Things are financially fairly reasonable for us. We don't need to be making decisions we don't have to make anymore. We've done that in the past. So now it's about, let's get it right for the people we work with. And the new signings, let's make sure we can deliver for these people. You know, let's yeah. really make sure that what they want, we can deliver. And, and so we're, we're just, we've got the luxury of being a bit tighter about our decisions now. But we do have a lot of room to grow. And we're excited about doing that. So um, let's just kind of detour into something else or something else that you're, that you're really into. And maybe you can educate me about it. Is that your... Um, you're a bit of a connoisseur when it comes to uh, scotch. And, <laughs> yes, uh, single malt. Single malt scotch. And we've seen, um, you know, you're, 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 I don't know, if, is it a cellar that you have or a cellar door? I don't know what the correct term is. A walk for, um, wardrobe, I call it. Oh, well, there you go. Uh, <laughs> and, and you, you know, you've been, you know, showing us bottles of stuff that, uh, you know, Napoleon had after his, re after his last, you know, victory <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> so what, um, how'd you get into the whole thing and get so deeply involved in, uh, what is it about Scotch and the whole thing about whiskey that uh, excites you, excites you so much? Is it the ADHD part of you, or is it is it just something? Yeah, that, yeah. You know, it, it is actually a real trait of ADHD. People is that they hyper focus on things. They often have hobbies that they can you know really hyper focus on. It's actually healthy for them to do. 
Um, when I realised that I years ago that I did have a bit of a drinking problem, it wasn't full blown alcoholism, but I did have one. I realised that I wanted, you know, I still liked having a drink. I still liked doing those things. So I kind of went for this, like, okay, I'm going to treat it like chocolate cake now. And I'm going to go really high end with it. And so I was, you know, buying really expensive bottles of whiskey and making them last for months, you know, rather than a cheap bottle of Jamison's and making it last for two nights. So it was part of that. And I just really enjoyed the research. There's also a really good community around single malt. It's a lot like wine people. You know, there's all these tastings. There's all these things happening all over the place that, um, that create a community. Um, so I, I like having something outside of music that I can talk to people about, have friends in. Um, I like the hunt. I like hunting things down. I like having something to do that's not music because I do hyper-focus on my business and my job and that's not always healthy. Sometimes I have to pull out and try to find ways of keeping this brain that never stops entertained. Uh, and this was one of them. And, and it started for me actually on tour with, with Airborne, right back in the early days of touring Europe. Um, I was on the, we were in, you know, you're touring these great big beautiful buses in Europe and it's like, you know, Jack, it's like being on a, a luxury yacht, they're just awesome. Yeah. We had this big dining booth downstairs, it was like two in the morning and I'm drinking beer and I'm there with Ryan, the drummer, who was still quite young at the time and, and our tour manager who's an English guy, Mark Stickland, and, and the two of them were sitting there going, and Adam, sorry, the English guitar tech, and the three of them were going, come on, try this whiskey. I'm like, yeah, whiskey, it's, yeah, it's crap, you know, like I'll drink my okay. beer, I can't stand and they just gave me some stuff and it just suddenly fired in my brain. I was tasting all these notes they were talking about. I was getting all of that. And I never got that with wine or other things. And the next day I was in a shop and then, you know, within a year I knew more than those three guys did. I had a collection. I was a member of the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. <laughs> I was a founding member of the Sydney Whiskey Guild. And, and that's how I roll. That's what I do when I get obsessive about things. It just goes really far. And I actually have to be careful not to go too far. So now I have a walk wardrobe in my home i had at one point nearly 800 bottles of whiskey in my collection down about four or five hundred now that i sell a lot of and buy a lot and flip them around and sell and do them at tastings and all these different sorts of things but it's basically a, a hobby and my brain needs hobbies and it's this and investing in stocks i like doing too not necessarily right now with the way the market is, but I have quite an obsession and an interest in that world. Um, but yeah, I just, I like to find things that keep my brain busy. Before this, it was Kiss Collectibles. You know, I was obsessed with Kiss Collectibles. Yeah. Until yeah. I good with them. And then I decided I didn't want to collect Kiss Collectibles mm. anymore. After getting <laughs> That's another story. Yeah. One, <laughs> of the, one, of the, one of the other great things of having a hobby on an outside interest from music is that it also introduces you to people outside the industry because even though we, music is a love and a passion and we can talk music to the cows come home for me personally i think it's been healthy to be able to interact with people from other walks of life because um new fresh information different ideas different possibilities all that kind of stuff and it, i think it, it enriches you as a person you know it, it helps you evolve rather than just being you know it's great to be very knowledgeable and go balls deep on things that you love and are passionate about but sometimes mm -hmm. it's like with anything um you know, distance makes the heart grow fonder. Sometimes taking a break from what you do into doing other things will let you come, or at least I find I come back in the studio after taking a little break of this or doing this or doing something outside that's removed from music. Uh, lets me come back to the studio, just more refreshed and, uh, you know, really um, just more productive, you know, when I get back into it. Yeah, absolutely. It's like giving, just giving your brain that rest away from it. And if, you know, this business can be all consuming, ADHD or not for anybody, it can be all consuming. You know, I see a lot of young musicians that have spent their entire young adult life wanting this. And then they finally get to a position where they've got labels and managers, people around. It's a really stressful time because they've been doing nothing but focusing on this for a while. And so they can tend to get into this period where nothing else gets into their vision, you know, and they start ignoring personal relationships and personal health and other things because this is very difficult to do, very competitive, it's very time consuming. And when you get here, you realise that and you start to really drill down to wanting to achieve the things you set out to do. And it can be a bit too consuming for some young musicians at times. Others rise to the occasion really well, but I'm not surprised that, and I didn't personally as an industry person rise to the occasion well when things started going well for me. I managed to make it look like on the surface it was, but internally I was suffering a lot and uh, it took a long time to find that balance there. Yeah. Um, do you think that it's hard to be, it's hard to be successful? Can you be successful and not be famous as an artist? Yeah, just ask the drummer to pick you back. 
<laughs> you don't think Nickelback are famous? <laughs> no, no, I'm being facetious. Um, I, <laughs> I, yeah, I do. I think especially in this day and age, um, you know, I guess Sia has kind of tried to do a version of that, almost like a, a pop kiss or something. Um, though I do think personally, as much as it kind of hurts me to say it, yeah, in this day and age, it's next to impossible to cut through without some sort of brand. And that brand in music is your personality, is you, is the band, is the lead singer, is what it is. I mean, the attention economy now is so difficult to market in. Um, you know, back when we started in the business, right, it was all about the kill shot. Uh, TV and radio ads, you had a budget, you had a hit, pretty much. Well, you know, you had to have a good song first, but you had to do that. Good songs get missed now because of the death by a thousand cuts mentality rather than the kill shot. You know, we got to get them on all these different social media platforms, street posters, uh, you know, online Google AdWords to try to, you know, be those assholes who are stalking you when you're looking for Ugg boots and you sell your boy and bear tickets. You know, it's like that's the kind of thing we have to do now to get your attention and to get you to buy tickets and music and that kind of thing. So a brand, a personality, a story helps a lot. And a, a annoying reality, but a reality nonetheless right now is that if you go to media with, hey, this is this really big band and they've got a new record and a new tour coming, they'll go, great, who's marrying a Kardashian? Who's spouse has brain cancer who is suffering from mental health illness you know like th this is what's going on now they want another story they want an angle because the media is suffering from the same attention economy and we have to be careful as humans here we aren't eating ourselves with this kind of a society because i can see that kind of happening like i'm looking at producing marketing and promotional campaigns that i'm not comfortable with but i don't know how else to get to people sometimes with those things we have, to, we have to be really careful here about how we're doing that, but I'm not sure we can stop it. It does feel a bit like a runaway train. But, um, yeah, it's, it's a real problem, I think, now. And, yeah, I'd find it very difficult if I had an artist who said, I don't want to do interviews, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do that. I'd say, yeah. And if they said to me, well, Kurt Cobain did, I'd say, yeah, Kurt Cobain still existed in a kill shot um, economy. Yeah. You know, he did. And he had a major label who spent millions of dollars marketing him. That was not done through some under-the-radar John Butler grinded out, independent, take control of your own business way. That, like Fugazi and Butler and guys like that do. That was a very different, unique story. Um, you know, and anyone who throws the radio head thing at me, I just want to vomit. I mean, God damn it, they had 50 million pounds spent on them. You can't say that those people are doing things on their own terms. They had a brand built for them as big as fucking Coca-Cola and then they went off and said they were doing things on their own terms. That's not fair to say to a young artist who wants that for themselves. It doesn't exist. It's not real, especially in this economy. Attention yeah. economy. Yeah. So it's very difficult. It feels instinctively wrong. It's a fact of life for us at the moment. Yeah. So it's a double edged sword that fame, isn't it? Cause it's one thing that artists want to get involved because they want to be known. They want to be appreciated. They want to be validated. But I think when they, when they've, everything is dependent on that and they get their, their, their sense of self worth from that. And then because everyone has a career goes up, goes down, people fade. And this is where we see a lot of the problems with artists uh, at the end of their careers. You know, what happens to, I mean, I know support out to a lot of uh, things with artists post career, but you know, what more do you think we can do? Uh, as an industry to help those people who have, um, you know, they're no longer on stage. Nobody wants to know them what they used to. They're not getting into the, the clubs and restaurants they want and whatnot. Um, they become redundant. Uh, what, what more do you think we can do as an industry? And what do you think uh, artists can do? I mean, do you think at the end of a contract, what's, what's done is done? Or, or do you think there are things that can be done to help people, you know, post career? after you know they get to that point where there's no more money coming in or yeah i think this is a really really important question uh i actually do think this is something that is going to fall and is falling squarely on managers shoulders to be aware of you know when you're it's human nature when you invest in the stock exchange for the first time or you join a team and you win the first three games of your season it's really easy and our brains are wired like this to believe that things are going to keep getting better right everybody thinks when things are good they're going to keep getting good if you look at history things don't do that they go like this, yep. right? Up yep. and down, like a yo-yo in cycles. That's the world. That's how it all works, right? So when you're the young band on Triple J and you just won five ARIA awards and your first album and you're the talk of the town and you're touring with big bands in America now and doing all the stuff, it's hard to think it's going to go away. It might go away on the next record. Might be that soon. Happens yep. a lot. Mm -hmm. So 
managers need to train their artists from day one. I think the day you're going, oh, we've got a song on the radio and it's starting to build and we can see where this is going and momentum starting to happen. That's the day you have that first conversation, that day. Okay, let's plan for a future. You know, what are we going to do when it all goes away? What are we going to do to keep it up there? Because all bands hit a ceiling. The Rolling Stone ceiling was stadiums. And they hit stadiums because they lived in a culture at the time where it was very different to market music and to expose music. It was an exciting time for all of that. They got a different ceiling. You know, other bands, uh, you know, Grinspoon ceiling is Horton Pavilions and Mark Arenas and this kind of thing because that's the world they grew up in within their thing. Every band, every artist will hit a ceiling on some level at some point, no matter what your level of success. And the trick is, how are you going to survive that ceiling? And John Watson once said to me that it's two very different jobs to manage an artist and then to manage heritage of an artist. Right. Two very different jobs. And I had to learn that with Grinspoon. I had to learn that we were going from upswing to heritage. And the band knew it. They were highly aware of it. You feel it happening around you. You know, you can see it happening around you. And that's when a lot of people normally lose their minds. You know, I was lucky Grinspoon are all really solid together people. And it was like, oh, okay, this is happening. We know why. Let's do this. You know, and we're becoming, I don't want to say this to be mean, but you're becoming the next Screaming Jets. You're trying to be the next Cold Chisel. How are you managing that heritage? And I think staying at the party too long is what makes people just sort of go this way. Yeah. You're just staying around for long. You've got to make people miss you. That's why we took time out or we did all that. That was managing heritage, you know, and it's important to understand that. So if you rewind five years before we did the Grinspoon 20th anniversary tour, we started discussing this. Five years before that tour, we started discussing it. Hey, we can see it on the horizon. What are we going to do? And, you know, guys started setting, we started talking about screwing away money to set up their own businesses, to do things. Some of them, you know, one of them got involved with his wife with a business and that's now a successful business. Another one, you know, opened a shop, you know, Phil decided he wanted a solo career and be a worker and get out there and do solo shows. And he's out there working all the time now, mm. playing his own shows and doing his own thing, you know. And so everybody, Joe, the bass player, is like a, sta you might turn up to an event, a festival, and the, your stage manager, artist liaison, is the bass player from Grinspoon. You know, these guys are managing their thing. They don't necessarily need to do this work financially. They want to have a life outside of this. They want to have a future in case it does completely go away. So they all have these things set up for this. So whether you're successful enough, you know, if you were going to use right now, you should be investing your money like a motherfucker. Be buying Amazon stocks. Be buying stuff for the future. Future-proof yourself right now. Buy an apartment, buy real estate, get your, you know, get the pillars done. Worry about your savings account. Worry about real estate. Worry about your superannuation. Worry about your retirement. If you're 22 and you're on fire, now's the time to start thinking about that because you're not like other people. You're in the music business and we go like this. Yeah. And you don't want to be stuck down here and not being able to get back up. That happens. Yeah. So everybody should be playing for it, including us including us. It took me a long time to future-proof myself for, the, for things. I'm still doing it. Um, you know, I think from the outside, if people look at my business on paper, they go, he's set for life. I'm well off and I'm certainly not going to complain. And I tell you now, I'm not set for life. Not yet, but I've got a plan to be there. So, you know, if, if it all ended now, in a few years, I'd be looking for a job. That's the dead truth of it. Right. And that's if I continued on my lifestyle for a few years too. Yeah. I'm okay. I'm not in a bad place. I'm certainly not complaining, but everybody has to future-proof themselves in this business and everybody should be thinking about it the day you start turning from fighting for development to it's starting to work. We've hit that tipping point. We're now headed into a trajectory. That's the moment. Start talking about it. Start thinking about it and start planning for it. Yeah. It's coming. Yeah, it's the biggest issue. Uh, again, all musicians are all broke and more broke and more broke, but again, um, they're not knowledgeable. They're not, they're, they don't uh, understand it. A lot of them even don't care. And I think that's a shame. I think they all should take some interest because even if you had a manager, okay, your manager's there and it's a job, the manager, that's where they get their 15, 20, whatever percent they're getting. But I think there's got to be a point that we've got to take some personal responsibility as well. So taking the opportunity to learn because at some stage they're going to be on their own. They may, may, they may not be with a certain manager, a certain label, a certain whatever. So anything they can do, like part of the future proofing, I think, is also learn some of the skills. So at least you can be... Um, Relatively conversant. I mean, again, I would imagine, well, right, give an example. For me, uh, a client will say, well, I know nothing about this. Okay, that's fine. That's what you're paying me for. I'm here to do a job. I'm here to help, assist, do whatever. But when I have a client that can sit with me 
and articulate what they want. They have a little bit of understanding of what I do. Um, they can talk that lingo, if you will. Um, I find that really helpful because if they can be specific, then that's wonderful. It takes out all the, all the guesswork, even though part of my job is to be able to see the vision, is to be able to you know, get it and, and do what I need to do. But when they can say, I want this, this, and this, that makes it so much, uh, so much easier for me. So I imagine for you, having someone there that has a little bit of skill when it comes to financials or when it comes to you know, having some kind of r- little bit of business acumen doing their own homework and they can bring ideas to you and say, what about this? Yeah. What about that? What do you think about this? You know, don't you find that? Sorry, mate. Don't you think that would be helpful to you as well? Yeah, I think it'd be hugely helpful. And, you know, we do have some artists that are, you know, it just, it's sort of naturally good at this um, without going into too much detail because it'd be personal. But, you know, Josh Pike is a great example of someone who's been able to, you know, really look after themselves from a career perspective and future-proof themselves and be very sensible and smart about what he does with his money, where it goes and where the future is headed for him. And uh, if you're a musician on the up and you ever bump into Josh, talk to him about it. He's taught me stuff about future-proofing and being smart about doing things. So, yeah, there are people out there that are just sort of naturally, instinctively good at it. Uh, I'm not one of those people. I've never really cared about money. I see it as a tool to get things that I want. I don't really see it. It took me a long time to see it as a future-proofing issue and and protecting for that. Um, And so I needed some help and I needed to get some support around me with that as well about planning it. Um, And what you say about what happens after the career as well, I mean, that's something I probably haven't thought about enough. I I personally and Wonderly does try to support support act where we can um we try to be in you know financially involved in some ways when we can and and you know just verbally supportive or whatever it is um because they do do good stuff and i have sent people to them not necessarily ex-clients just friends in the business that have headed in those directions stuff and they've been really helpful um to them so support act is an amazing thing um but you're right there probably does need to be more done there i'm not sure what the answer is there yeah well i've certainly seen it in the electronic industry which uh I mean, the rock industry has been around for a long time in Australia. I mean, it was built on it. But, you know, I've got friends and clients who work in the electronics scene. So, you know, it, people have been in for 20, 25 years or now coming out of it and they're hooked on drugs. And there's nothing like Support Act to help them. And I found that to be uh, interesting. And maybe that, yeah. I don't know if it's something, I mean, it's not, nothing that I could start myself because I, I don't have the financial means. But it just got me thinking, you know, that, um, Maybe some like they should try and start something up for the uh, electronic music uh, people who have been around for a, a very long period of time. No? Yeah. But, mate, but mate, Greg, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna wrap up the podcast, my friend, and let you go. Um, I know you're a very busy man. I appreciate the fact you've given us your time and and being so open uh, about lots of things. And thanks for your insights and thanks for all the info you share with us today, mate. And uh, if you're ever down in Melbourne and you got the time, let me know because you can maybe give me a little Scotch masterclass and teach me a thing or three. That's great. I'll take you to my favourite whiskey bar in Melbourne and we'll, we'll go and have a chat. Sounds good, mate. Thanks for having me too. I really appreciate it. Always happy to have a chat. Let me know if you need me again. Oh, yeah, I certainly will. Thank you so much, my friend. It's been wonderful. Right. Well, that right. is... That, we'll do, mate. That's uh, So there you go. Greg Donovan from Wonderlick and uh, we're out of here. So thank you very much for watching or listening. And as always, so please be nice to each other. But more importantly, be nice to yourselves. I love you, fuckers. And we'll see you round. <laughs>